Hello. This is my full review of the book of Jonah. If you're looking for the quick version, which is just over two minutes, you can find that link here or in the text description. Now, this was uh, released in 1972 by Jonah and Clive Everton, and essentially it's a biography and training diary all in one. Now, Jonah didn't actually write his sections. He spoke with Clive, they were recorded, and then essentially transcribed into the book with very, very little change. I paid eight pounds for this one, which is a lot more money than you will need to pay for it. I paid it because it was in very good condition and it was a first edition and it's hardback. I like hardback books. You can buy this book for two pounds plus postage from a website called abebooks.co.uk. Link is in the text description. So it's very easy to buy. It covers his early life and how he got into squash and the things he did before he got into squash. It covers his early career and how he met people and what he did to, to train and all of those things. And it also talks a lot about how, how his status as an amateur was causing him problems in his mind and he wanted to become a professional and he wanted to take the game to a new level. Because in case you don't know Jonah, um, really did change the game. He changed the way people thought about it from a, a tactical playing point of view, but he also changed it from a business point of view as well. So he talks about those early things. There's uh, lots of talk about something called the Barrington Circus, which is this incredible idea that he had instigated, started, paid for, where he took five, prof uh, not professional, sorry, five other players, and from the middle of August, to the middle of January, more or less, they toured the world playing exhibition matches, giving clinics, just promoting the game. Now, they made sure that they were in the right place at the right time for the major championships. Um, I don't know if they were actually away for all of that time or they came home for some of it, but I got the impression that they were literally away for, for all of it. And he had such high hopes for that idea. He thought that other groups of professionals would be doing the same. Because at the time, the idea of making your living just from playing tournaments was outlandish. There weren't enough tournaments. There wasn't enough money in the game. And the key factor there, as we'll see when I look at all of the details, is because without glass back courts, without glass courts, you can't get enough people to see it. And even with television, it just didn't give the essential part of the game, the dynamism of the game. So he talks about how, you know, he hopes there'll be more of these touring circuses. He talks about the establishment, which what we mean by that is the group of people who were running squash and he attacks them. There is a scathing attack on how they are limiting the game, how they are stopping it going from amateur status to pro to open status. I was going to say professional, but open status. Now, this was a big problem at the time and tennis had gone through a similar period where there was a clear distinction if you were a professional, you coached in a club and you maybe played some exhibition matches and you got some money. But if you were an amateur, you had to have a real job. You had to have one or the other. You couldn't be both. Um, whereas nowadays, the idea is crazy. You can just go and do things. And in fact, the only sport I can think of that has um, amateur and professional separated nowadays is boxing. I don't know, maybe maybe you know of others. And apparently from what I've read, there is a good reason for that and people want to keep it. The difference between amateurs and professionals is very, very big. And in this case, you can get really hurt. Whereas in other sports like tennis and squash and table tennis and badminton, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter whether somebody works in a factory and then plays tournaments or whether they train all day. They're all allowed to play each other. There's uh, other interesting talk when he talks about lots of tournaments and about matches and about rivalries. So there's so much going on in there. Everything's easy to read, even though that there's essentially two authors. Switching between the two is not a problem at all. Both of them write beautifully and it's easy to read. You, you don't feel as though that you're struggling. You're, it's like lists of names and people. It's nothing like that. It really is just a relaxing read. Do I recommend you read it? I do. And I don't really want to be recommending every single book because I won't be doing that. But even though you might not be an aficionado of the sport, even though you might not want to know all the minutiae about the history and all, all, all of those things, even though it is a very old book, we, what are we talking? We're talking 50 years old almost, 48 years old. It's still interesting enough the way he explains things that even 
casual players would probably enjoy reading this book. I, I, I feel confident in recommending that uh, a player who enjoys the game would, reading, would enjoy reading most of this. So yes, I do recommend it. So what have I got for you in the next book video? I've got this. This is The History of Squash whoops, by James Zug. This is a very detailed book about the history of squash. So I'll be talking all about that in my next book video. So let's start the flick through. Well, the first thing that I want to talk about is right in the jacket cover. And it says here, um, which could overtake tennis by the end of the not of the 70s as the most popular of all games for two players. Can you imagine the confidence and the ambition that they had at the time? They really thought that squash was gonna be bigger than tennis or badminton or table tennis or any other game. And I love that sort of optimism, that's so cool. All right, moving on. So here we go, we're on page 16. And he talks about, you must practice with maximum discipline. The satisfaction comes when you play a good match and you know it's because of what you've done. Now that sounds very obvious. You work hard, you get the result. But too often, people think about the match play and they forget all of the hard work that goes into it. You really have to put the hard work in if you want to play well. I make videos for people who really want to improve. I'm very happy for the people who just want to play squash once or twice a week, don't want to do any other training, they play squash and they love it. Great, I'm so happy that you do that. But if you really want to improve, you've got to put the work in. So that's a very clear idea there. Next one. All right, next page. Uh, at the top here, page 47, it talks about how Cam Nancaro, Nancaro, sorry, uh, Funnily enough, turned out to be the player who gave me more trouble than anyone. And that's often quite possible, that there's one player who is not necessarily better than you, is not necessarily better than anybody else you play, but his or her style is one that clashes with yours. One that you just can't seem to work out, what's the best way to play this player? Now you've got a couple of options. You can focus on yourself, focus on what you do well, and do that to the best of your ability. Or you can consider changing your style to match his or her style. When I say match, I don't mean the same style. I mean, do something that counteracts what they do really, really well. Now, that's maybe a time for another video, but you do see that quite often. But much more interestingly, uh, a few lines down, it says, when I next played him 18 months later, he was a different player. He had far more deception, hid the ball well with his body, and knew much more about length. Now let's look at those three. Um, deception is something that I need to make a video about and even club players can introduce in their game. Trying to make a shot look different or at least disguising it so it all looks the same. That can really help. The point of contact could be earlier at the normal time but uh, with your racket head behind so it looks like a straight drive but it's a boat. Lots and lots of options and it really can make a difference. And the second part is connected to that. He hid the ball really well with his body. Now at the back, it can be done. You can just come around a little bit more, either forehand or backhand, so that the point of contact is covered by your body, If assuming your opponent is on the tee. He or she can't see that. And that little fraction of a second of indecision or doubt can make a difference between hitting a good return and them hitting a weak return. Now at the front of the court, that's even more useful and more obvious. If you go directly to the ball, although you should be going in a round if you can, because you'll hit the better shot. If you do go directly, if you can cover the ball with your body and they can't see what shot you're hitting, they've got a lot less time, and I say a lot less time, in terms of how much time's available to see. They've got less time to see what you're going to do, and they've got less time to make a decision. So hitting, uh, covering the ball with your body can be a really useful thing. But for me, the most important part of that sentence was, he knew much more about length. What can you know about length, you might ask? Well, you can know about the different speeds that you can hit the ball at different heights, and whether you push it, whether you slice it, whether you hit it flat, there's a lot of variation in length. And yes, it's always nice to think that you can hit great shots to the back. But as I've said in one of my quick squash tips earlier, hit every shot at a different speed. Because if you hit the ball at the same speed, irrespective if, it, if it's a really good length, your opponent becomes accustomed to that. 
And you might say, yes, but then when I throw in the other shot, it catches them by surprise. You could argue that. But by hitting at different speeds nearly all of the time, you're constantly making them doubt. And it's not almost that nervous energy about what's going to happen now that causes them problems. So that's an interesting point. Let's move on. All right, here we go. We're on page 54. Just a little bit of a tidbit here. Jonah became a nude model. Yes, there are drawings of Jonah with no clothes on. But it's interesting because it shows you that he was prepared to do anything that he could to get enough money to give himself time to train. On to page 55. I think it's essential to be involved to some extent in something else for, part, for a part of the day, away from the squash courts even though my thoughts more often than not will still funnel back into squash. And this is a very good point. If you are totally consumed with something, but you don't have an external outlet, it can become like a feedback loop where every small thing becomes a huge problem for you. You don't seem to have improved since yesterday. You're hitting your shot. Oh my God, what's going on? Sometimes you just need to get away from the court. You need to forget about squash if possible, and you need to do something else. And that's true of all standards, of all types of players. And it's especially true of young professionals. You cannot be totally obsessed. You need some outlet to relax. It will make your squash better. All right. Here we go. We're on page 58. And this is talking about um, a match that he played against uh, Aftab Taleb. Um, and he's talking about how he was winning and then this particular player started to do things that we've all probably encountered, people bumping into you, people, you know, taking too long, looking for a tissue, oh, I need to change my, my racket because the strings broke, all of those kind of things. But the part that really interests me is he split his shorts, he cannoned into me, he continued to hit me with the ball. I think about 13 times in all by the end of the match. 13 times, can you imagine that? You get hit once and there's like, you know, seriously, you know, please don't let it happen again. 13 times in one match. So the next time somebody hits you, put it into perspective. All right, next page is page 60. Here he's talking about playing in a very important tournament. And he said, I had a dose of flu at the beginning of the championships, so I was lucky that the circumstances favoured me. And the point I want to make here is humility. At some points, you can't assume that you're the best, you've trained the hardest. Sometimes luck plays a difference, and in this case, he, he was ill, but things worked out to his favour. You need to stay humble. Next page. This is page 62. This is talking about practice, practicing, um, Azam Khan has sharpened him as a match player. Now, we always or we often talk about something called match fit. No matter how much you train, no matter how much practice you do, no matter how many drills you do, it is not the same as playing a real serious match. So that's something that you need to always bear in mind, that if you're working towards a, a particular tournament, try to see if there's a tournament before that's not too close but not too far away to allow you to assess your match readiness because matches are completely different. And if you follow any other sport, you know that, that they often have an injured player, they're training with the team for a few weeks, they bring him on, or if it's like football, they bring this player on for a, a little bit just to see how he's prepared to go. And it's the same for squash. Match fitness is a little bit different from training fitness. All right, on to the next page, 63. And here he's talking about how he was inveigled, which means he was sort of like forced into playing his game. And that often happens as well at all sorts of level. Um, uh, I was inveigled into playing his game, hard hitting to the back of the court, instead of varying it with chips, lobs, and so on. So this is talking about, don't let your opponent dictate what happens to you. You can play different types of shots. If he's or she's hitting the ball hard and you're running around and you're hitting it hard back, change it. If somebody's hitting the ball slowly because they need time, try to rush them. Don't be bullied into somebody else's game. Next page, page 64. This is a psychological point here. This is what he's talking about after he won uh, the first major 
tournament, the first major championship for, for the first time. And he says, I felt that enormous cavern of anticlimax which seems to hit one afterwards. Now, for club players, that's maybe not such an interesting point, but for a, an aspiring professional or somebody who does want to play tournament play, after you've won a tournament, it's not all roses and smiles and happy faces. There is a period where you feel, what is finished now? What do I do now? I won. And you're not so excited anymore. As he says, the cavern of anticlimax. And players who win big championships and big tournaments, you can feel that afterwards. You've kind of done it. And what do you do now? And that's uh, an interesting problem. All right. On the same page, he talks about uh, Ken Hisko. Ken Hisko was leading him to love and 5-4 in the third game. And this is a theme that runs through a lot of Jonah's stories, that he's down and he seems to have lost already. He seems to have been finished, but he keeps fighting. He never gives up. His discipline, his character won a lot of these matches. Yes, of course, he was fit. Yes, of course, he could hit great shots but he was fit because of his character and his discipline. And it's a theme that runs through. On to the next page, page 65. But, and this is a, um, something from the Times, and it says, but Barrington was hitting, was now hitting the ball instead of pushing it. And that doesn't seem very much difference when you're on court. There's a difference between commitment and intention and playing the shot because it's your turn. And you, of course you have to play the shot because it's your turn. But I often talk about intention. Don't hit the shot because it's your turn to hit it. Hit it because you've got something very clear that you want to do with it. Hit it, don't just return it. In this case, the uh, journalist said pushing it. Okay. Next page. Page 66. Again, talking about matches and things. Every point was virtually a match point. And we talked about this before in the sense that you need to take every point seriously. And when we, uh, when I worked with Graham Stevenson, a wonderful coach for the London and South East junior squads, we used to run this mini tournament in the middle of the, of the weekend where all of the matches were eight all. And this was back in the day where it was to nine and you had to serve to, you had to be serving to win the point. And we played from eight all. And it was one point per game. And the idea was to really focus your mind because too often we focus for a few points and then we for, we sort of drift away for a few points, especially if we've won a few points. Oh, we, you know, we won a few, we can relax a little bit. No, every single point was a match point. Every single point was important. Right. This is on page 78. This is talking about um, David Brazier. And he's talking about this particular person. I don't know this person. I, I can't attribute, uh, I can't attest whether it's true or not. But he talks about that when this person was on court in matches, he could not have worked harder. He could not have tried harder. But he didn't really do the training beforehand. And that could be true of many people. They get on court and they try their best and they don't always get the result they want. But... That's not enough. You have to have done the training before. And that was one of the very first things we looked at. If you don't do the training, you can't expect to play consistently great squash. Uh, page 85. This is talking about where um, he set himself some targets. So I set myself certain targets along the way, but without worrying too much whether I reached them all. In fact, he set himself seven major championships wins. And this is... An interesting idea because we often think that when we set itself our target, it's failing if we don't reach that target. But I have said recently that we need to focus on the things that we can control. Focusing on things like this can be useful for motivation, but you shouldn't judge success and failure on whether you win all of these particular matches, whether you win these tournaments, whether you win your box, your league. What you should focus on is the things that you control. Use these ideas, tournaments, matches, even particular play, beating particular players, as motivation more than guidelines for success and failure. All right, next page, page 86, 87, he's talking about the um, British Amateur Championships in 1968, and he won it 
without dropping a set, which is pretty amazing. All right. More interestingly, on page 87 at the bottom, even though I had had my most successful year, even though I was regarded again as number one, the burden of responsibility was eroding my confidence. Being number one is harder than working towards it. Keeping number one requires more work because you are constantly doubting yourself. You're constantly thinking, have I done enough work? Um, am I good enough for this position? So even the best of us are constantly doubting ourselves. So if you're going through a stage where you doubt yourself, you're not alone. It's quite natural, but you just have to keep working hard. So even though he was number one and he had the responsibility of working hard, it was making him lose confidence. Very interesting. Next page. Um, this is talking about his character. And um, when he lost, Jonah was an absolute demon. He said, I felt a grievous sense of injustice and bitterness, and I hated all around me. Now, I'm not suggesting that you have to do that to win matches, but it shows the depth of his hatred of losing. And that was what kept him working hard. Now, I'm not suggesting that you have to be the kind of character that absolutely hates losing and you have this bitterness, but it just shows you to be number one, you've really got to use all of the things that you've got. And in this case, it was this complete dislike of, of um, abhorrence of losing. All right. Next page, 89. He produced his most disciplined squash at the right time. And this is the mark of a very great player. So I can't argue with Jonah on this, that when the time comes, you have to do what's necessary. And if you don't do it, then no matter how much you've trained, no matter how well you played in earlier rounds or in earlier part of the match, when the time comes, when you need to be most disciplined, if you don't, you have fallen short. We're not talking about winning or losing. I'm not saying that if you don't win, you won't be a great player. But if you lose and you've given your best and you've played disciplined squash, well, what more can anybody ask? But if you get to the point and you're not taking it seriously or you play these stupid shots, you're th thoughtless, well, that's a shame. Next one is some photos. Um, what is interesting is how similar both of these photos are. It just shows you how similar the techniques were um, from all of these players. And I didn't know that Mo Yassin was number one. I was lucky enough to spend some time with Mo and his son. Um, uh, some, he gave me some coaching. Um, and it's interesting that, um, that this happens. In fact, earlier on, I talked about Aftab Taleb, but it was Abu Taleb, so I apologize for that mistake earlier. But lo notice how similar they are. All right. All right. Now, Page 99 is talking about uh, the discussion when squash was going from amateur to open. Open means that professionals and amateurs can all play. You don't separate them. And how much he was fighting to, to get this done. And there's a, quite a lot of that in this book. So this is a, an interesting an interesting thing. Um, and it talks about um, the game has boomed, exploded, become popular. Um, to such an extent in recent years that there have inevitably been many abuses of the rules concerning amateur status and there will be more until the game becomes open. Now, nowadays we don't even, most youngsters and most people will, won't even think about that. But back in the 70s, there was a split and I think tennis was the same a little bit earlier. There was this professionals and there was this amateur status. And you were a professional where you worked at a club and you maybe played some exhibition matches and you did some things. An amateur, amateur had to make a living from other things. Nude modeling was that example. And being a milkman, you know, working in a factory, all of those kind in an office. Um, and nowadays it, it's, it's everybody can play everybody. In fact, the only sport that I know, and perhaps you can correct me if I'm wrong, the only sport that I know nowadays that still separates professional and amateur is boxing. And from what I've read, that's a very important distinction because the difference between those two is a huge difference. And when it comes to somebody's safety, then you need to do that. So if you know of any other sports, um, let me know. All right, page 109. 
He talks about, I wrote in my diary, and I've talked about that before as well, that people who really want to improve should keep a diary. Now, I'll make a whole video about that if people want it. But essentially what you need to do, you need to be recording what happens in matches. You can record the score, but talk about how you played, how your opponent played, what you might have learned from it. Even if you don't keep the diary, the process, and this is a scientific fact, the process of writing something down helps you remember it, makes it real, makes it important. So he kept the diary. Page uh, 110, check out this schedule. All right, so on the February the 4th, for instance, I ran four miles between 8.30 and nine. Did court practice, so that's solo practice, 10.30 to 11.30. And then from 11.30 to 12.15, did interval, um, he, then he played, he did some practice playing. And then from 12.20 to 12.40, he did interval training. So that's like sprints and then a rest, sprints and then a rest. And then from 5.30 to 7, he did weight training. So that's 90 minutes of weight training. Um, and in um, other days, he also played in the afternoon. So that was a heavy schedule. A bit lower on the page, he talks about how he recorded his pulse. Now, nowadays, we've all got these watches where it records our pulse for us. But back then, they didn't have anything like that. I wouldn't be surprised if he was one of the few people, not only in squash, but in the world of sport, who actually recorded his pulse regularly. Right, page 113. This is talking about him doing a tour. We played for 27 successive nights. Think about that. You're not just playing, you're playing exhibition matches and they, they're quite hard work. They're not just easy ones, you play hard. But 27 days in a row, they played hard squash. That would have been tough, goodness me. All right, on to page 117. Here he talks about the exhibitions that he was playing and something called two against one. Now, as you can probably guess from the title, that means that two players play against one player. And it is an absolute riot. It is so much fun. I was very, very lucky to play with my close friend, Amir Sheikh, uh, two against one against Jahangir Times quite a few times. We had so much fun. We never won, but that wasn't really what we were expecting to do against Jahangir. Um, you get a lot of benefit. Everybody who plays this game gets a lot of benefit. First thing I need to tell you is that you need to be of a fairly high standard. You can't just do this if you're a beginner because it could be quite dangerous. The same with playing doubles. Doubles on a normal squash court is absolutely fantastic. I love it almost more than singles, but that's another story. So you can play it, but you need to be a um, at least a fairly good club standard. The next thing to know is that you shouldn't play as a as the team, as the two, you shouldn't play too many cross courts because that can be a little bit dangerous. Um, but generally you can play everything else. Now, obviously the benefit for the individual comes from having to work much harder because the rallies are longer and, and the shots are harder to reach. The benefit for the two, the pair, the team, comes from the ability to play really tight shots down the wall. And what happens is you'll notice that your shots are tighter than they normally are, partly because you're not having to move as much and partly because you know that's probably what you're going to be playing most of the time anyway. You benefit from tighter shots, you benefit from playing more volleys and you benefit from boasting the ball and moving the opponent from side to side. It's a wonderful game and Jonah plays it here and I know lots of club players who play it. If you haven't played it, definitely have a go. It's great fun. All right. Next page. Next page is the uh, 119. And here he's talking about Japan, how he feels that Japan will be really successful. And he says, and he says, success came to a spectacular degree in Japan and where there were only three courts. So that must have been an incredible experience. There are only three courts in the whole country, but he really feels it was a spectacular success. They must have had a really good time. And he talks about Japan a little bit later. We'll see. All right. Moving on. All right, this is the bottom of 124, 125, and it says you judge a man's standard on what he does in major competition when the chips are down and the pressure on. The chips are down is a, a phrase in English which means when you've got the most amount of importance to something. It comes from gambling, um, you know, like casinos or playing poker where you put all of your chips on the table. My chips are down. I'm committed to this championships. 
Now, from a club player's point of view, I want to stress that success should be how much fun you have and how you reach your level of talent, okay? From a professional's point of view, or somebody maybe more ambitious, it's how they do in matches and tournaments and competitions. And the reality is that no matter who I have beaten in practice, no matter how hard I have trained, no matter how much mental work, no matter how much technical work, no matter, my success as a player will be judged based on my competition results. And that's really what he's saying here, is that you have to decide what you want. You wanna have some fun and you wanna improve a little bit? Fantastic, go ahead and do that. You wanna be considered successful in sport, You've got to get the results. All right. Okay, next page, 127. And here, it's very clear about these circuses that there is no way that this is going to be a major financial contribution to a professional's life because they need glassback courts. With standard courts, you just can't get enough people. And squash suffers from this. When you think about tennis, badminton, table tennis, other types of racket sports, and there are other types of racket sports. Paddle is a particularly uh, trendy one at the moment. They're open. Everybody can see what's happening. Where a squash suffers from this idea, you're in a box, you're in the gladiatorial arena, and that makes for a great experience for the player, but it's not so good for the spectator. And he's noted, noting that without glass back courts, this is not gonna happen. And of course now we've got all glass courts and we've got more television, but it's spectators that really matter because if you can grow the game by showing it to more people, then that's what really matters. And he's, he's very you know, clear here about that. All right, next page 128. Here he's talking about there will be more circuses. Everybody will do what I did, and that's what he's saying. I was the first, it was my idea, or at least I think he was. Um, and it was great, and we really learned a lot, and, there's a, and we had a great time. Other people will do that. But as it turned out, they didn't. And they didn't, and I don't know why they didn't. Um, the reality was that he probably felt at the time that there was not going to be enough money in professional squash just from tournaments and players would have to find other ways and this was a fantastic way. Now yes, clearly there are always exhibition matches and clinics happening all over the time but this was a group of five who toured the world all doing it in one particular tour and that's what he thought would happen more. That's a shame because that would be like a really cool thing. Anyway, page 129 comes down to some thinking here. He talks about being um, he, playing uh, Cam Nancaro uh, in the final of a tournament, and he was two love and love five down, love five down in the final game. And this is a theme that you see quite a lot with his matches. He must have had incredible mental fortitude to get to these situations quite a lot and still come through and still believe. And of course, each time he does that and other people hear about it, when you're playing against him, even if you're you know, five love up and two love up in games, you're not gonna be completely convinced that you've won and nor should you be. You should never be convinced you've won until you've won. Don't think that getting to match ball is enough because people have lost many times from match ball. Now, at the back of the book, we're not going to do this, but at the back of the book is a list of his results. And it's worth perusing and seeing how many times he was too love down. And I suppose that if you play plenty of tournaments, that's going to happen sometimes. But it happens quite a lot to Jonah. And he still had the fortitude to come through. Really uh, inspiring. All right. Here we go. Page 138, Japan, Japan, oh my God, Japan. Japan will be the sensation of the 70s. He was convinced. I'm surprised he didn't move to Japan. Now, I'm not saying he was wrong because maybe at the time, and I always thought, wow, Japan would be like the perfect place. There's not much space in Tokyo. Squash courts, you know, don't take up that much space. They should be really popular. Um, but it didn't work out that way, which is a real shame, especially considering we've got Tokyo 2020. Um, what a shame. Now, something maybe more uh, important here is uh, in a little bit lower down in 138, he talks about how he recognizes that his contribution to squash is going to be the tremendous emphasis on fitness 
and match preparation. And of course it is. He changed the game in this regard. People realized that if you want to be the best, you've got to train hard. It has to be a physical game. And all sports are physical. But if you've played squash, you know how physically demanding it is. He also goes on to mention that he feels Jeff Hunt will be the one with the recognition for contribution towards a more technical, tactical game and how he maybe changed the game from a technical point of view, better technique and the way he played it as well. So that's quite an interesting thing. All right. Now, this is page 146. It's talking about... Uh, changing the rules and one of the things that they were talking about was they were going to penalize players who stamped their foot just before they hit the ball but more importantly just, you wouldn't be allowed to bounce the ball before serving what why would somebody do that so the administrators of the game at this time were i don't know i don't want to say anything disparaging but really those kind of rules are just absolutely crazy i mean i think some of the rules that we still have now are crazy maybe that's another video but stopping people from bouncing the ball that's just that's just stupid okay last one um page 147 um when he won this tournament he weighed, he won, sorry, he weighed, he won 500 pounds, which if I convert that with an inflation calculator is 5,700 pounds. So winning the British Open at that time gave the equivalent of 5,700 pounds, which is not very much money. Um, it's trying to say in today's spending money. So the inflation calculator sort of works out what it would be. So players today, earn a lot more money than they did back then. And you that was why it was so hard to become a professional because even if you won the major tournaments, you really could, there weren't enough tournaments to win. There weren't enough contracts to get from manufacturers to be able to make enough money as a professional. So it was tough. So making that choice to go professional back then was a serious decision. Thanks for watching. Hopefully it was of interest. Please consider subscribing if you think my content is worth it. This is a video that YouTube thinks is a really good fit for you based on what you've been watching recently. And this is a playlist of all of the other book videos. Remember, do something every single day to improve your squash. See ya.